my name is John Spence. I am the North American Director for our Data and AI Service Line at ThoughtWorks and have been involved with a client for a period of time. So I'm going to do my best to represent Murley. I hopefully will do well. And any of his uh, colleagues or Murley out there, please forgive me for any omissions. Let me introduce my colleague here, Divya Joshi. Divya is also a part of ThoughtWorks. Divya, would you like to talk to him? Yes. So let me just take it back to data mesh. When we talk about data mesh, we talk about a mesh of business and technology. So John here is from technology and I'm from business. I'm actually a client director and head of partnership for ThoughtWorks India. I'm basically a BD professional who loves data. <laughs> and uh, I have worked in multiple geographies, continents, moved from one place to other. But Boston is home because I'm a Sloan graduate. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to talk to you about Data Mesh, which is one of my passions. My team has implemented Data Mesh projects. So I have seen it very, very closely, worked with stakeholders in their journey. So looking forward to talking with you. Fantastic. And we're going to talk today about the adoption of data mesh. At ThoughtWorks, we consider ourselves uh, passionate practitioners. We're excited about getting our hands dirty, actually doing the work. So while many of our folks have, have been including the books on data mesh, have, have been involved in publishing, have been the authors, it's really about us using those techniques to help our clients successful. We're going to go through that today, provide the example. We want this to be a conversation. We want you to ask questions. There are some good questions already online, as was pointed out, and we're looking forward to answering your questions as well. So we're going to move through the content quickly so that you can start to pick it apart and, and dig into it. And the goal is for you to walk away with a better understanding of how this would actually be implemented. Did you, do you want to kick us off? Of course. Why not? Let me start. <laughs> this is formal. <laughs> right. So we all know data dynamics today is it's dynamic. It's moving. Landscape is complex. It's a case of data, data everywhere and not a drop to drink. <laughs> And uh, data mesh as a concept has emerged as a socio-technical construct that helps harness data in this complex environment. And we have the progression as well as the results to prove it. So in this session, we want to dispel some of the myths and confusions around data mesh. We want to talk about data mesh in a very practical approach We'll try to build the problem first. We'll talk about what are the trends in the environment? What are the challenges that are coming up? Then what is the, what is the impact of not solving these problems? Why the problem is so hard to solve? And then we'll talk about way forward. And of course, the taste of the pudding is in eating it. So we'll talk about two case studies, Gilead, John will talk about it, and Saxo Bank. Then we'll talk about what are the critical factors in success of data mesh, and then we will end with a framework for CTOs. I think uh, we can start. And anytime you feel like you can stop us for questions, or you can keep them for end, we are fine both ways. Absolutely. Because we want to hear as much from you as I suppose you want to hear from us. So let's. Talk about, first of all, what are the trends? There are a... Oh, sorry. Sorry. I have a problem multitasking, so <laughs> forgive me for that. So what are the trends in the environment? So first of all, the user base is becoming larger and larger. More and more folks are using data for different devices. And then it's not only the internal folks who are using data. There is a partner ecosystem. Think Amazon or any bank. The data has to transfer seamlessly between two organizations. It has to be kosher. It has to be secure. And regulatory environment is not helping. It is becoming more and more complex, and you have to comply. But not only that, these things drag you down. But organizations also want to move forward. They want to lower tech barriers. The technology is to be given in the hands of people who are going to use it. That is the business folks. And then... Now, organizations are going into cloud, different connotations for data now that brings a different set of challenges. So 
if we can if we talk about now the principal challenges that come out of these trends there's certain things that come out first of all that these there are some landscape changes and then there are environmental changes when we talk about landscape changes we see let's talk about cloud first so since data is moving to cloud the relational old structures do not hold good graphs are making way and that is a little complicated if we talk about larger user base two things stand up stand out very very clearly one the business teams have analysts who demand data in different form and shape and core data team is closer to data infra second thing is more and more business functions are now using data so imagine marketing is using same data finance is using same data operations is using the same data but their contexts are different why they will use this data will be different everyone wants data in their context and that's a big ask for data team core data infra core data team that is closer to infra but that's not about all what happens is because of this difference in context and increasing requirements the data latency goes up and organizations are looking to actually lower data latency because that's what helps business also they want to reduce dependency on tribal knowledge they want to lower tech barriers and net net data discovery is crucial so why what is the impact of not solving this problem so data latency let's talk about this first i'll give you an example i was head of business development at uber on supply side and i would do a partnership that will bring some drivers on board i wanted to see how these drivers are performing is there a particular time of day when they switch on their app is there a geographical preference for these drivers or there is a particular behavior when i went to my tech teams first of all i could be last in the line <laughs> and then they did not get what i want when i'll get the data it will be late by the time my requirement is over or whatever i get is not very useful to me and i couldn't do it myself because it needed sql queries i didn't know that so what happened i stopped using the data so whenever there are issues of data latency it results in non uses of data and then when there is dependency on tribal knowledge there is always a confusion i'm not sure i know this person is smart enough and she's giving me data but is there a way i can verify what is the what are the matrices i don't know that and then there are access management and log of access issues they can lead to whole pandora's box regulatory compliances and data breach are big humongous beasts in fact for data breach there is a study that demonstrates that organizations that go through data breach consistently perform lower on nasdaq even 3 years after the data breach from their peers so what i'm trying to say here is it's not only monetary implications but your brand and reputation will take a hit and it's hard to recover from that and these things apart the inadequate controls actually lead to lack of productivity as well as bad developer experience that will eventually stop you from moving forward at a pace that you want to move forward so these are some of the implications you all know them i'm sure you are living them but why is this such a big challenge and what are the root causes so some of the things are first of all it's a culture and mindset issue and those are hardest to change then other thing that we have seen with our clients is that the current state understanding or as is state is not very well defined you don't know what's happening in one corner of your organization is it really happening as people are saying what is the way to figure it out so those challenges stop you from moving forward sites this is an organizational issue so you require c level sponsorship 
then dependence of tribal knowledge has some political con connotations. People with tribal knowledge may be politically really powerful in the organization. They won't want to let go of that power. And then there's a confusion that there's no clear path. How do we move forward? This is basically lack of organizational clarity, lack of frameworks. Then there's a gap between business and tech. Then in addition to these things, data is not like a software. It's more cumbersome. When it is software, it's just code and it's infra. But when it comes to data, it is data, models, rules, and then regulatory requirements make it hard to move around data. That's why this is a complicated problem. Then what is the way forward? So when we look at the challenges, at least four things are coming out very, very clearly. And let's address them one by one. So when it comes to discoverability, then to address it, we can create a discovery platform. And we can give producers control to pro provide metadata and business definitions. Then when it comes to dependence or reducing the tribal knowledge, we can create clear business ownership of data via domains. Automation or self-serve platform is another way that will help people reduce this uh, dependence. Data latency is a big problem as we saw. And for that, we have to define data quality framework. We have to enhance data quality and make data owners responsible for data quality. And when we talk about tech barriers, we know in organizations, some self-serve tools exist, especially in IT area. But how about giving these self-serve tools to business folks so that going back to my Uber example, had I had self-serve tools, I would have simply searched for data and done my job. How about that? So in addition to that, if application teams can build data asset themselves, if they are given the capability, this problem can be solved, then we can define and automate controls that comply to the standards and policies. So net-net, I have talked about these solutions and these are the things that data mesh addresses. But nothing, we will not talk about data mesh without talking about its implementation. So I'll hand over to John. Excellent. Thank you, Divya. Do our little dance here. Uh, and so some of the topics that Divya just talked about, the decentralization uh, breakdown by domains, giving that um, pushing ownership out to the business, also enabling your developers, to, enabling your, your technology teams to operate independently using a platform and products approach are things we're going to talk about in the data mesh approach. What I want to do first is set the context on Gilead's journey. And I'm going to say this first too. As I mentioned before, I'm filling in. I'm also a consultant. I'm not the client, not the optimal situation. And I'm probably going to be a little more careful about some of the information I might share. I'm not the client itself, so I feel a little more respectful or, or protective of the information. So forgive me if I'm in intentionally vague in some points. So we've been working with Gilead for a little over a year now in terms of developing the case and, and planning the implementation for data mesh. And this comes on the back of a larger transformation, not even just a digital transformation, but like any good digital transformation driven by business requirements. Now, it's not surprising to us after the past two years that there's tremendous focus in the pharma and the life sciences industry on time to market. I've heard it expressed in many ways, molecule to market and getting drugs through quicker through the process. And there's a recognition that this is critical to their success for, for them to complete their mission to the world. So one of the key goals for the Gilead organization of the next uh, eight years now is to bring 10 transformative therapies, therapies that are more tailored to the individual that have a more profound and a, a greater effect on the, on the treatment of patient, patients. Along the way, they recognize to enable that, like many organizations going through this transformation, for us to drive that innovation, to be more effective, a key element is bringing the talent that can provide that in 
uh, that uh, innovation that can support that collaboration. So how do I bring the cast of characters together who will enable us to create that success? All while on the third part, as we've learned over the past 15 years of the internet revolution, doing it in a way that is respectful of our investments, that is effective uh, and a judicious approach to investing in innovation. So how do we make sure we keep the, the wheels on the bus as we're, we're going through the journey? So this drove to a number of strategic priorities, and, and what came clear was that mission of data, that the, the requirement for innovation to occur, especially in this industry, is to break down many of the barriers that exist between the various parts of the industry to enable more innovation, to gather insight, to understand the market better, to understand the efficacy of their treatments, to drive to that more uh, uh, that faster time to market. And so the vision and mission statement here to elevate a data-driven culture and drive new revenue by treatment, uh, by treating data analytics as assets across the enterprise, to enable that democratization of data, to enable those innovative new employees to drive that insight was critical to the organization. So this drove this framework in which we started to discuss how would you execute against that strategy? How would you make that successful? And um, for those of you who aren't in the industry itself, all industries, all businesses, we have silos. We have parts, functional aspects of our organization that are separate. But in life sciences, that separate that separation can be very intentional. There are, are regulatory issues and uh, you know patient um, confidentiality. There are concerns, so you break down into these various areas, these various domains within the life sciences space that you are supporting with specific analytics, your research and development, your, your, your development and manufacturing versus your commercial analytics. But you recognize that supporting them are shared capabilities, shared infrastructure, shared technologies. How do you leverage that to support those more effectively going back to those, those judicious investments, but also starting to, to help break down the barriers where appropriate, enable that. And that's where we start looking at an operating model that is going to support that, that governance and the proper separation, but at the same time, enabling collaboration. There are a whole bunch of slides here. I'm moving through quickly. So if there's something you want me to go deeper on, I'm happy to once we get in the questions section. So, here, where we're talking about is that data-driven culture and the, the elements to it, and we talk about this a lot in our industry. We love to talk about being data-driven and creating a culture of, of data, data. What does that actually mean? There's a technology piece enabling the business and IT organizations to both embrace new technologies, but also make uh, trusted data available. We're talking about it before. It was a great in the key, great discussion about this in the keynote. We've been very as, as data owners, as technologists, we're, we're kind of protective of our data because we know where the bad parts lie. We know there are some pieces that if we just share it and our business stakeholders or our users consume that data, they're going to come back with questions. They're going to lose trust. So how do we create that trusted data? At the same time, there's this concept of building data literacy. How do we get people to move from anecdotal evidence to actually measuring the qualitative, to using measurement, to thinking about it from an experimental standpoint. How do I work based on data? How do I work ba based on facts? I was working with a telecom industry as well, and this was the same challenge. They weren't talking about their tech challenges. They were talking about how do they get their business stakeholders to start thinking in terms of what is the data telling me? What are, they, what are the insights? How do I trust that rather than trusting my gut? So there's multiple components here, changing the culture, changing the mindset of business, and also changing technology to create that data-driven uh, data culture to enable that innovation. And so again, we're going to talk about how data mesh, the approach data mesh, helps support many of these elements. And so and Divya was talking about this a little bit. If we look at some of the prior experiences, some of the challenges that they'd faced in the past, it was monolithic approaches struggle at scale. When you're trying to branch across those, those organizational boundaries, as your organization achieves a certain size, those monolithic approaches still work, 
but they require more effort, they require more time, they require more management. How can we enable more rapid on-take of data in those environments? It's very challenging. So what can we do to change the paradigm so that we're, we're enabling the connection of data? We're saying, okay, we're not gonna have one big monolith, we're not gonna have one big solution, we're going to bring multiple sources together. How do we then facilitate that if that's the approach we're going to take? Uh, we're also, one of the, the points that I mentioned here, top-down data governance does not work. In our exploration with the organization, one of the things that we found was that governance within their organizational silos was quite effective. And that the folks in the commercial side knew their business and knew how to manage their data effectively. Likewise, in the R&D uh, group, there was good management, good governance, and understanding of the data. It was the interoperability issue. Once data, so when we talk about interoperability, there are multiple layers to it. It's not just about putting the pipes together. It's also, here's a term, here's a bit of data that I'm providing to you. What does that data mean? How do you use that? And how does combining that with other pieces of data have an impact on its availability on its sensitivity. So being able to communicate that and facilitate that through a governance program that extends across the organization was one of the, one of the challenges. So in working together with Murley and his team and taking many of the frameworks that they already had in place, we started to look at how we would build on, these, uh, on their approach and help them enable up here first, those business outcomes, and, and this is one of the things we stress, and Divya had talked about before, is focusing on what are the outcomes that you're looking to achieve. It's not just about building the technology. It's not just about providing the data assets. It's about actually, you know, if we look at it, how do we accelerate product supply with reduced costs? That's the goal. In fact, again, I remember one of the, the, uh, the speakers in the keynote talking about this concept as well. What is the end goal that you're trying to achieve and thinking about how you get there and then aligning your assets and your strategies against those. So thinking about as we're trying to achieve these outcomes, how are we looking at some of our strategic imperatives to support that? Cloud first, moving off of the traditional on-premises technologies, data democratization. <laughs> Tough term, you know, I, I like to say, you know, data, we all talk about data, uh, we all like to talk about data democratization, but if we don't have a good governance in place, democracy without governance is anarchy. And so this is critical when we think about spreading data and making it available, how are we doing it effectively? These strategies are then supported by a, both a set of technologies and capabilities that we're providing to the business. And the, it's a providing the capabilities, I think, that is key. So now we're going to get into discussion of data mesh. Data mesh, as Divya had talked about before, is we refer to it as a social technological approach. And I say we. In the book on data mesh, Javak Dagani, one of our uh, technical principals, uses that term. Her point is, is that it is not just an architecture, nor is it just another silver bullet approach. It is a set of principles and practices that are applied to enable an organization to connect data at scale. And those principles are simple. Domain ownership, I was saying before, pushing out responsibilities for the ownership of data to those domains. We, not a new concept. We've talked about data stewardship for many years, decades even. But it's how do we break down those separations, the classic separations that have formed between the producers of the data and then the consumers and presenters of the data who are, you know, we move through that pipeline, we change it, we reformat it to use for analysis, but it, it loses its connection and that, that feedback cycle into the, into the operational data is lost. And that's where we get a lot of our data quality issues. So providing that responsibility at the domain level, trying to bring virtually your analytics and operational data closer together so that your representation of reality is more rapidly, representation of as your business looks at data and what it is really becomes more aligned. Data as a product. This was um, when I first talked to Jamak about Data Mesh and she first presented it to our organization four years ago now. This was the idea that to me was most exciting is this concept of 
thinking of your data as a product. I started doing data warehousing back in Deloitte in the, in the 90s, and we were always about building the edifice, building the, that, that set of assets. How do we bring all this data together? How do we build the repositories? I wasn't thinking about servicing the client. I was thinking about building them a workbench from which they could service themselves and they could make themselves effective. But thinking about data as a product, who are my consumers? How do they use it? How do I cross that last mile and provide them the value in the format structure and in all the qualities of the data that make it effective to them? That concept, that principle is critical for success. Self-service infrastructure, we talked about self-service before. The whole platform, the idea of building platforms, again, not new and not something that we think we've created. Others have used it across the, uh, across the industry. If we enable platform capabilities so that others can use that and build on top of that, rather than our traditional models, and I go back to things like our, our traditional pipeline, at least as I always remembered it, modeler, architect, ETL developer, report writer, had to move through that processing engine and the time that it might take and the delays that occurred along the way were what were preventing us from answering a question quickly and effectively to the business. How can we enable product-oriented teams to work more quickly, more effectively? And the platform approach is, uh, is key to that. Last topic is federated computational governance. This is a term, <laughs> and if you follow this discussion of data mesh on, uh, on LinkedIn or on Twitter or other uh, social media, this is the one that gets a lot of grief. People like, you can't federate governance. It is not federating, it's not distributing the responsibilities of governance, not distributing the, the policy making, it's not pushing out ownership entirely. It is how do I move faster, more effectively in a governance model? How do I enable those policies to be adopted more quickly, enforced more effectively, enable people to operate efficiently and continue to innovate while also ensuring that those the policies that I need to be in place are in place? So I've talked about principles here. This is very ethereal, right? I mean, it's like, okay, great. That's data is good kind of stuff, but it, it's starting at these principal levels and thinking about what you're trying to achieve rather than going to a solution or an architecture that we think is critical in successfully adopting data mesh. And I'm gonna try and move quickly through this because I know I'm burning time and I wanna get to your example as well. So the data mesh governance framework, we talk about creating these products. And when we say use the word product, we're not using it in a vague or abstract uh, notion. We have a very specific description and detail of what a data product should look like. There are attributes to a data product. It should be discoverable, addressable, trustworthy, self-describing. These are units that exist within your, your mesh, your data mesh, that you can access, you can understand, and you can verify so that you can use this data with confidence. And so we create a framework so that you can provide that interoperability between the business. The platform provides that control plane, policy enforcement, discovery, all of those capabilities that you can purchase through tooling, that you can enable through tooling and a, a variety of products. But it's getting those, those products out there and published so that your end users and consumers, both your, your developers and your scientists can use them effectively. I want to get forward to this. So how did we actually apply this at, uh, at Gilead? How did we help them adopt this? And by the way, to be fair, they are on their journey as our most organizations. These are transformations that don't occur in a week or a month or a quarter. They're year-long, multi-year-long journeys in adoption. It started out understanding you know, your basic understanding of the, the technology landscape, we talked about those business drivers. How do we map those out into specific outcomes? What are things that you're trying to drive in the business? If we talk about, for example, accelerating uh, the uh, development and manufacturing process, how do we support that? What are some specific outcomes that we can drive? Where can we re recognize the opportunity to connect various sets of data, various sources of data together to achieve those outcomes map that out into a strategy, and then start to drill down specifically into the use cases. So if we're talking about accelerating, you know, in your, uh, accelerations in supply chain management, 
where are specific cases where we can connect data and drive towards outcomes. And we are currently, and I'm, I'm looking at one member in the audience right now because she's actually leading up one of those teams. We've just kicked off one of those. Am I correct? Thank you. So we've just kicked off a work stream on in the supply chain area, man, uh, supply chain management area to deliver against one of those initial use cases. And I highlight this approach because this is how does one start the journey? One does not go out and boil the ocean. we we'll use other metaphor. You start with business outcomes that you can drive. You drill down to specific instances. You demonstrate value to the organization as you start to plan out for that broader adoption, that broader change that is going to occur in the organization. So, you know, one of the things about moving to the products, we talked before about this, this uh, we haven't come up with a good acrostic, acrostic, acrostic for this, uh, D-A-T-S-I-S. Datsis. Yeah, but that's not very good. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, it's, is where moving from what we have now, the experience we have now, where we have catalogs, we've, we've been using tools, uh, Alation Informatica for many years. Um, we have any of the capabilities, but what we don't have is we don't have all of the information that is critical for the business to use that in confidence published and published in an effective way. We aren't infrastructure independent. We don't, and in talking about moving at scale, at talking about enabling teams to move at speed, that independence, that ability to provision and execute is critical. So we're, we've, we're helping them move towards this new world. And I highlight here, particularly the one I brought before, that cross line of business coordination. How are they able to effectively and properly share data across those, those lines? I am going to I want to cover just a couple more. Again, I want to make sure we get to the Saxo, but I would get into this really quick. I've talked about the product approach and the product and platform approach. And here's where we're actually starting to get into some of the real meat here of how do you create these ideas of the, of the various platform teams or levels of self-service. So at the base level, you have your infrastructure and utility. How do I provision the, the, the capabilities? How do I spin up? in this case, EMR or, or sol other solutions. How do I enable developers to do, do that without being very proficient, deeply technical? How do I make those capabilities available so that product teams can do the minimum infrastructure work and focus maximum on how does that data need to be presented as a product? So I'm moving to a point where I can enable product teams to deliver these uh, both these capabilities and the products in the fashion that we expect them to be. Lastly, we have on top of that, the mesh. How do we enable these products to work together? How do we share them? How do we en enable that discovery across the organization to drive towards that, that end user? So, so we're looking at a platform on a platform approach. You have the teams that provide the, the infrastructure, enable the data product teams, who then enable those, those teams at the mesh who are servicing those end users. This is a little bit of the organization structure. And the thing I want to talk about here, highlighting that cross-functional team leaders, cross, uh, uh, these cross-functional teams. Again, one of the things in my experience in working through the clients and having here is moving from what has traditionally been a very horizontal and functional design of IT, and particularly data management organizations. Again, individuals who do analysis and modeling, individuals who do the architecture, individuals who do the transformation, and the end reporting and delivery. Moving to those cross-functional teams and that product and platform model so that you're redesigning your organization to support that, create breaking down those classic impediments and trying to enable scale. So those pro how do we enable product teams to solve the problems of business more effectively? I want to highlight something here. If you go out and you're looking at a lot of information about product or about data mesh right now, there's a lot of talk of the architectures and the technologies that support this. I haven't talked about that much at all because we see the focus and the energy on creating those teams and organizational structures. The technology will support that. There are many ways to, to, to take care of those those problems. There are many great solutions. There is data virtualization, data fabric. There are approaches that people can roll their own 
for example. So the technology is valuable and enabler, but it's not critical to the approach. And it's also not what's going to get you over the goal line. So in rolling out this program, there were some new changes that had to occur for Gilead. There was a, you know, a program sponsorship well, that exists already, but how does that drive into supporting those domains? How do we start pushing responsibility out to the visual domain owners and the product owners so that we are creating uh, that, that sense of ownership, that ability to deliver data? We're also looking at how the enterprise governance fits in. I mentioned before, strong domain capabilities, but not that strong capability for, um, uh, for cross-domain discussions. Uh, driving adoption. I think we've talked about org uh, organization, or I talked about digital transformation, and we talked about all the or in the prior session, forgive me. In the prior session, we talked about a lot of these things about how they facilitated uh, change in the organization. I, I cannot stress enough the points about connection, about reinforcing change in behaviors. You can present ideas to people, but if you don't create the infrastructure for them to, to unlearn traditional practices and learn the new practices, you're not going to change. And so things like office hours, even newsletters, videos, evangelists who are out there who are driving that. How do you keep people you know, from starting to drift back in the direction? All right. I went over time, even though I tried to talk really fast. Divya is going to talk about her experiences at Saxo. So I'll skip the lesson learned at Gilead because we are reiterating them in the next case study as well. So... So, uh, Saxo Bank is another place where we implemented Data Mesh. And first of all, what is Saxo? So Saxo Bank is a European online investment bank. And uh, they have on one side, it's a platform. On one side, they have the consumers. Who are the consumers? They are traders who trade on behalf of high net worth individuals. There are retail investors and there are institutional investors. And on the other side, there are banks like HSBC, Citibank, and the works, the investment banks, who provide financial products as well as access to capital. So you can imagine how complicated this ecosystem is. The requirement is that data has to be kosher. Data has to be transparent. They should be able to trust data. And from Sexo side, their app has to be whitelisted in every environment. So here, their objective was that they wanted to, first of all, enhance data quality. Second, they wanted to reduce time to market. And the third thing is they wanted to facilitate interoperability, specifically by becoming whitelisted. And ultimate aim was open banking. So with this, I will now go to, before I go to product, because it's a good analogy. Uh, John talked about data as a product. So here I want to talk about data as a product, but let's take a step back and think about those four principles. The first thing was the domain-driven design. What happens is domain is no unicorn. You have your business functions. They become domains only. You have to provide them adequate tech capability so that they are self-sufficient and they can manage data on their own without help of core data infra team. So that is domain-driven design. Now we come to data as a product. What is a product? So here is an analogy. We created data workbench for Sexo Bank. Now, when you want to search for a product, I know John doesn't like this principle, that's his principle, but we are talking about that only. So first of all, when you want to look for a product, you go to Amazon and you type the name in the search bar and it is discoverable. Similarly, you could type the name of a data asset. Those data assets whose business definitions are consistent inside the organization because you have a business catalog. Type the name and you can search this data asset here. So it is discoverable. Now, product in Amazon has an address. You can find it. So it is addressable. Similarly, here also, you had 
an address for all your data assets, making it addressable. Now, product descriptions can be found in Amazon. Similarly, here in Data Workbench, data assets are self-descriptive. So it is self-describing. Now at Amazon, you have consumer reviews, so you can trust that product. Similarly, here also, number of uses and people's feedback is there. That's why it is trustworthy. In addition to that, different functions or different domains could use the same data. That's why it was interoperable. And then the data was secure. I will not talk much about data governance. If you want to know more, please Google data governance and governance in uh, data mesh infrastructure, a CISO bank case study. This is a paper I have written along with the client and our team. So you'll find more details, including architecture, tech architecture there. So when it came to what, are, what were the outcomes? So some of the high level outcomes that were, first of all, reduced cost of customer acquisition. Because otherwise, it took months altogether to onboard a bank. But with data workbench in place, the time reduced to less than 15 days. Second was the cost of operations. Because the bank is more than 40,000 employees strong. And a team of seven data engineers actually managed data workbench for whole organization. And third was actually defense because it reduced the chances of compliant or failure or regulatory violations. So by making it more and more GDR and other uh, data regulations compliant. So these were the high level outcomes for the bank, but there were outcomes for data owners and data consumers that are listed here. So with this, I want to quickly touch upon as to what were the critical success factors. In fact, I'll not even touch upon. I want to leave time for question answers. I'll just talk about what are the ready recorders for the CDUs, because this is important. So first of all, you have to get your organization ready. If someone today tells you, we can come and install data mesh for you, or we will come and create data mesh for you, it's a white lie. <laughs> Nobody can do that. This is an iterative cost process where you have to do things. And by the way, you will have to do a lot of homework on your own because you have to make your functions transform into domains. That's a big job. And then out of those domains, you will have to figure out which is the right domain to do your, who will be your guinea pig? Who are the open people? All that homework you have to do. And then you're, Technology has to be ready. And then keep in mind, this will entail organization change. Because if you give, say, marketing functions some technological capabilities, you will require organization change. And that's hard. And after that, you have to get right tools and partners. You have to depend on some of the courts, but you have to, every organization is unique. So you cannot buy courts off the self shelf and just implement them. They have to be consistent with your organization's requirement. Their feature and product roadmap has to align with yours. They their flexibility has to align with yours. And similarly, when you're choosing partners, you have to choose a partner who's as innovative as yourself and you're ready to go into a test and learn approach. Last but not the least, you have to deliver quick and con uh, continuous business values along with alignment of team, technology, and platform development. So I think with this, we finish. I know we have very little time for question answers, but nevertheless, we would like to jump right into it. Yeah. We have a lot of activity here on the Q and A's, if, if those of you are following me. Before I break into the Q's and A's online, I wanted to open it up to the audience here. Um, is there any questions that you would like to ask uh, our colleagues from ThoughtWorks? Um, there are two mics, and I would appreciate if you go to the mic so that we can, those folks online can hear it as well. So any questions from the audience here? Come on, don't be shy. Yep. Any way you can go? Yeah. I know it's hard to get out of there, right? Uh, 
Thank you for the presentation. Uh, how mature uh, the data organization must be in order to implement data mesh, right? Because I understand that, uh, unfortunately, most of the data organizations, they are not mature enough to manage single like data monoliths. And going to this model that is very distributed has a lot of challenges on this governance, tech, organizational, and so. What do you recommend to get more mature in the old model, then jump to the uh, data mesh or go straight to data mesh as a new organization? Can I take this? Of course. So uh, I have spoken to folks all around the globe and understood the challenges that clients have brought to us. And my personal opinion is that you can start in data mesh from anywhere. Because as simple as a small thing such as a data catalog, which makes all the definitions inside your organization consistent, is also part of data mesh. It's a critical first step for data mesh. Imagine if the definitions are not consistent, there's so much of confusion. So you can really start small and you can figure out your way. So that's the short answer. Yes. One more question from the audience. Uh, quick question, I mean, you talked about, I think a lot of the culture and the organizational challenges, but John, from a, a technical standpoint or platform standpoint, what is the biggest challenge that you face in Saxo or, sorry, Saxo or Gilead? Yeah, I, I would say the biggest challenges that you face from a technical perspective in adopting data mesh is it is still an, a new and evolving approach. And there are many of the components and capabilities that you're going to stitch together yourself. So as Divya was saying about selecting the tools. So you're going to go out and you're going to, and I'm not advocating, I'm just using these examples. You're going to go to Alation or, or, or to Informatica or some of the other product owners for the, for your metadata repositories, for your, for your tools. Maybe you'll, you you introduce some tools to support master data management, but you're going to be building these products and there's still components that are the market is still maturing on. So to the point that question about maturity and ready to take this on, um, our, our recommendation to clients too is, is like you're going to have to have strong technical capabilities to support the, the, the creation of these project products. You're not going to buy it. You're going to buy pieces of it that are going to support it. So you're going to have to have the capability, uh, that architectural capability to say, I, I see how the matrix all comes together. So I'll just add to it what John is saying. For that, you have to have a really clear understanding of your own landscape in the organization. Sometimes that's very, very hard. Mm -hmm. And if you want to invest in an audit of organization, sometimes the budgets are hard to come by. I saw that happening. So those are the technical challenges, but they are also social. <laughs> OK. Yes, go ahead. Could you please share a bit more comments on the definition of data products? It's usually it's very difficult uh, topic in the practical terms and the curation of those ones that are created. Yeah, a curation is a great point. Um, first off, the definition of the data product. A data product is a is a container, considered a container that has certain act that exhibits certain attributes. Those attributes are uh, are ports that describe how I present the data to various consumers. And so you're going to create services or APIs that present those ports to the, to the client. Now, I'm, I'm being a little vague here and we can get into more details. Again, what we, we do with our clients in our interpretation of this is that we create those standards with our clients to fit within their organization. So if you're going to adhere to certain practice, practices of having input and output ports, defined inter interfaces for that container. Um, you're also going to have a control plane so that you can manage the container. You can, you know, initiate or enable observability, manageability of that container to meet the SLAs or SLOs associated with that, with that product. Um, the specifics on how you implement those, whether you write those from code or there are some new products coming out, uh, a company called Nexla has been exploring this, uh, creating uh, low-code data products. Those implementations themselves are not critical, but but having those those specifications, 
the, as part of the, the input ports, the output ports, the control plane, having that, those elements in place and adhering to those principles is really how we work with the client. Now, you mentioned curation before, and I think that's a great topic. I'll try and be brief on this. Um, any product goes through a life cycle. And there are points that a product may become obsolete and you may be able to replace it with other products. And one of the things that we've seen in our data warehouses and data lakes is a proliferation of assets, some that are valuable and some that aren't. Your ability to curate, your ability to, to, to figure out what you should be delivering to end users, in my experience, is going to be one of the things that dic dictates your success, the effectiveness of your platform. So thinking about the concept of curation is really critical. So I'll just give an example of data product. For example, in Saxo, rate of interest was a data product. IRR was another data product. And Ron, sorry, product has to follow DATSIS principle. <laughs> I didn't say it's not an, I just said it's not a good one. I know. <laughs> so they have to be discoverable. Mm -hmm. They have to be addressable. They have to be trustworthy. They have to be interoperable, secure, and self-describing. Well, I think the principles are clear, but which scope of a data product? Yeah. The variety of data products will be limitless. Categories. They will be limitless, yes. And your organization will define the data product. As I gave it an example for a bank, a rate of interest was a data product. So I hope there, that there is a there is a taxonomy too about source aligned data products and how they map to the to the the input uh, the the source systems and then creating uh, uh, consumer aligned products. With one healthcare company, we got to a point where we created a longitudinal health record, which was a very highly complex and specific product to meet a need. There was a question. Yeah. Yeah. One question, and then I do want to go to online. Yeah. Would you mind going to the mic, please? Thanks. I'm sorry. Hi, um, Alex with KPMG here. This is really fascinating. Um, so two questions. One is, you know, Degani came out with this concept like a few years ago, like right? jury's still out. So one, what gave you the chutzpah to like go and push this? And then how did you get, uh, you know, a Gilead, which is, you know, a pretty significant player to buy into this new innovative concept? Wow, those are great. Those are fun questions. Are they fun? Uh, um, <laughs> Jamak says it really well too when and, and you know are talking about well this is still new and her point is you're right but if you look at the practices you know if you look at the work that is in data mesh a lot of it is based on work that she had been doing for years in the microservices space and thinking about we got to a point where we had to start thinking about decentralization it was too big for one centralized approach and so we're taking and, and for us particularly at thoughtworks we've taken many of the practices and principles uh, principles and practices that we employ have employing to building solutions to to data to enable this and you're right the i, I I don't know if the, I would of course say, I don't think the jury's still out on it. I think there's value in the approach, whether it's the same thing in two years, whether I'm preaching the same stuff in two years is going to be, uh, is a question in my mind. We're going to learn and evolve. Um, to your second question, I will answer that, is what we have seen particularly is a number of life sciences and healthcare organizations have been struggling with the challenge of enabling data to move as quickly as they need it to. And they've tried the approaches and had one client uh, we're working with as well who said, yeah, we were gonna build another data lake and it goes back to that definition of insanity. If it didn't work twice before, why is it gonna work this time? So I, I can add a little bit from my experience of selling Sexo. So I sold Sexo, so I'm not going to give my secret sauce to you. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, we went really deep in understanding what they really wanted, what their real problems were. So mm. cost of customer acquisition was one of the big problems. Mm. Onboarding banks used to take just forever. And for them, trust in data was very, very important. And that's how we suggested this approach to them, and it worked well. Feel terrible. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at the clock. I want to make sure our online audience has a chance to also hear. Now, this is the number one voted question. Uh, so I am obligated to ask it. 
and it is challenging. It's a little bit of some of what's already come up. So according to a recent Gartner hype cycle, <laughs> data mesh comes under obsolete category. What's your view and take on this? Sure. Sean, you want in to a few start? Minutes. <laughs> sure. I will add to it. Oh, I can answer it in one word. No. Um. <laughs> Again, no, I said I'm obligated. It was the top. Yeah, top oh, no, it's, question. <laughs> it's it, it, you know, of course, I read that article, and I think some of the the concerns that were brought up are very valid, as was pointed out. It's an evolving, emerging approach and discipline, uh, and I won't say that we've done it at thirty or fifty different clients. Um, one of the things that I took away from the article was it was very focused, and as I've talked about today, on the technical architecture supporting data mesh and some of the practices or some of the approaches that have been put in place and saying, well, these will eventually become obsolete because of certain technology. And it's like, that's fair or certain approaches will. However, the principles of data mesh, I think treating data as a product, decentralizing, I, I don't think they're going to become obsolete based on my experience. I think they're, they're going to be, again, I, I expect it to evolve. I'll be preaching something very different in two years, but it'll be based on the same principles I, because they've been the principles we've used in the past for successful development of microservice applications and platforms for our clients. Right. So first of all, all the love to Gartner. They are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's their job. So they, they have to evaluate technologies. And uh, I'll give you a corollary here. Um, at one point of time, ThoughtWorks pioneered Agile. If Gartner were to rate Agile somewhere, it will be beyond obsolete. So we are talking about a set of practices, not a technology in data mesh. You have to think about, think differently, think about decentralization. The practices will continue evolving and continue being adopted. Technology may get obsolete, it may change. So we are advocating here for this socio-technical change. That's the answer. <laughs> So we have only three, about three minutes left for Q&A. Um, there are a lot of other Q&As online. I, I would just ask you if you would, uh, if what we don't get to, if you would go ahead and answer Absolutely. them online. Absolutely. And I, I guess the final question is one that got the second number of votes. And, I, and you've spent a lot of time talking about data mesh. Obviously, that was the topic. But there is still this question that had a majority of votes that said, so what is data mesh? Sure. And, and, I, and I think that question comes really from a, What's the elevator speech, right? Sure. You don't have an hour to present data mesh and principles. How would you explain data mesh to your, your business leaders and those that would have to sponsor it? Oh, okay. you, please. You are the <laughs> elevator pitch queen. All right. I, 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 will just, I will just do an elevator pitch and open, open Pandora's box. <laughs> At the same time. <laughs> right. So data mesh is a socio-technical approach for decentralizing data that brings together analytical and ops data so that your business users can harness it easily for decision making at the tip of their tongue. <laughs> so I will define data mesh in this manner. Technology doesn't come here. When we talk about data mesh, we talk about what value we deliver to the, the customers, the end users. And we talk about very clearly that it's a socio-technical approach. And I give a parallel to Agile here because that's also a set of practices. Yes, there are four principles that are core to it. That means you have to create domains who will own their data assets. You will have to treat data as a product, as you saw in Sexo example. You will create self-serve platforms that will help your business users, not only your tech users, you will have computational federated data governance. These are the four things, but when it comes to what it is, it's actually, I won't say that, you know, you have a data lake and you can't do data mesh. No, you can do data mesh with data lake. You want to keep your data decentralized and do data mesh? Yes, of course. And as the gentleman asked, the, the little thing that we can do, we can do data catalog, we can do data lineage. We can consistently build as a ladder as to what are the 
basic fundamentals of data mesh. I hope that answers. Yeah, I, I, that, I think that was uh, that was great. Um, I, I just uh, a personal perspective on this. Um, I think Mythical Man Month was written a couple years even before I was born. Exactly, two years before I was born, <laughs> and a book that is so full of wisdom that has per continued through our industry. It's just unparalleled, and one of those pieces of, of wisdom is there is no silver bullet, but we have been looking as a discipline in the data managed world for our silver bullets for 40 years. And I've been part of it. So we focus on the practices. What is it that you're doing and how can you do it better rather than on the tech? Because once you can fix that, once you can get your, your principles and your practices right, the technology, I won't say it falls into place, but it becomes very clear how you can employ it to its, its greatest impact. I like to talk about it in terms of an operating model. So I describe mm -hmm. it as an operating That's model, great. if you just sort of simple terms, or even, you know, a business architecture. If you think about, if you look at the definition of business architecture, and those two words seem to resonate with the business, and, and, and they can uh, start to visualize what that is. So look, this was fascinating. Thank you. I know we ran a little bit over, but uh, hopefully this is very valuable for all of you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> Thank you.